So this evening we have a very interesting speaker and a very renowned scientist from the Indian Institute of Advanced Sciences, uh, which is part of the IIC campus, I think, right? I've never been there. Yeah. So it's called and National Institute of Advanced Studies. National Advanced Institute Studies. Of Advanced Studies. National, National yeah, NIAS, yeah, National Institute of Advanced Studies. So when uh, Anindya suggested a couple of those topics, this uh, topic seemed to be very close to <laughs> our layout and uh, seemed quite interesting. And especially since I'm a neuroscientist, that made it even uh, closer for me. So uh, let's uh, start the topic, I think. Anindya, over to you. Let's uh, sure. see what you have to say about this very intriguing subject. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And I wanted to particularly thank who was very keen that uh, we speak about animal behavior and cognition, which is one of the programs uh, in the Institute. <clears throat> Let me start uh, with uh, uh, this little video clip uh, of uh, about two bonnet macaque males. And as you will see that uh, they are doing something very interesting. So let me start with the clip and then um, we can have a quick discussion. Hi Shabu, sorry, it's slightly late. Come, come, come. Danny, just stop shouting for me. Hi. Can everybody except for the speaker switch off the audio and video because this video is dragging a lot, slowing down. Yeah, so uh, I hope you got to see uh, a bit of um, what I wanted to show you, which is uh, a bonnet macaque, which has picked up a mango. Uh, this is a, a wild mango that has come floating down the river, Moyar. Uh, which is separates the Bandipur National Park from the Mudumalai Tiger Reserve. And as he picks it, he washes it before eating it. And at one point, you may have noticed he kept it under his foot, but seemed to forget where it was. And so he looked for it. And as he looked for it, he went through the water, uh, you know, trying to look for it. So he felt under the water. So clearly, uh, he had an idea about what the uh, mango looks like. Uh, what its shape is, which is why he could feel for it. And then once he found it, um, he washed it again. Uh, now, uh, there are several elements of the macaque's abilities, um, cognitive abilities, if I may add, which you could see there. Uh, part of it, of course, was his cognitive use of water as a tool when he washes initially his own fingers in the water. And then he uh, washes the mango. And this, in fact, is a cultural tradition. It's a culture which many macaques share in that particular population in Bandipur National Park. And the fact that he or she has a mental image of the macaques shows that there is a template against which it is matching the tool uh, or the, the mango, the object that he's looking for. And once he finds it, he washes it again. Now, all of this seems to indicate that the macaques are in fact, cognitively sophisticated animals. And I just wanted to show that to you as a little clipping from my work, which shows that their intelligence or their cognitive abilities can be in the mechanical domain. It can be the social domain. And today I will talk to you a bit about the cognitive abilities of bonnet macaques with the question of 
are they really conscious in what they do? And um, uh, so this is going to be a short talk, and I hope I don't exceed my uh, time limit, but I'll be open for discussions as well. So please do let me know if I've spoken enough and you want me to keep quiet after that. Right. <clears throat> now, so in our own work, we've been studying various aspects of the lives of these macaques. We look at communities, the species itself, populations within the species, the societies that constitute uh, the, each population, the individuals who constitute these uh, societies, and of course, my own interest and what I will talk about today are the minds of individuals. And one point I wanted to make here is that although our work is at various levels of organization, uh, and you can you know, imagine all that I'm saying with regard to yourselves, because humans are basically guided by the same kind of evolutionary principles that macaques or the bonnet monkeys are. And what you then realize is that at every level connects to the level below it. And so if I have to understand the primate communities that I study across the country, I will also need to understand the minds and the decision making and the cognitive processes of these monkeys, right? And they're connected at various levels. On the right of the screen, you will see pictures of five different macaque species. And though I don't have time to talk about them, I just wanted to tell you that the macaques uh, represent perhaps the largest genus of non-human primates. And in terms of distribution, the macaques are second only to humans. They are found right from Afghanistan to Japan. And there is one species, the ancest which is nearest to the ancestral form, which is found in Northern Africa and in the southern tip of Spain in Gibraltar, where some of you, if you've been there, may have seen the Gibraltar monkey, right? Now, uh, the important question that confronted me when I started working on the primate mind, uh, I've listed here. The first is, what is it like to be a monkey? And this is a philosophical question. Can we ever imagine what it is to be like another species, right? How did we come to be what we are today? what is the evolutionary process or the processes that may have guided the evolution of the non-human primate mind, which ultimately led to the culmination of the primate mind. Can we understand more fully how the primate brain works? And this I know is of interest to Shibu, but I'm sure many of you may be interested to understand how the brain works. And only when you have a paradigm which is out there, for example, in this case, a social decision made by a macaque or why it decides to wash a mango and how it does it or how does it visualize a mango. When we have these paradigms, we can then take it to the laboratory and try and understand how the brain works and how does the brain itself, how has the brain evolved from that similar to uh, that of a macaque to that of a human being today. And finally, will our knowledge of the primate mind influence the way we relate to them? We do know that we have less qualms, perhaps, about squashing a mosquito and, than driving away a macaque. I'm, I'm sure all of you in uh, your colony have been disturbed by the presence of the macaques and may have debated whether perhaps it's ethically right to remove the macaques. And if you get to know that many of these individuals are perhaps conscious, they may have certain kinds of uh, emotional responses. Surely your actions will be colored by what, how, what you now know of them. And therefore, uh, and this is something which I think is extremely important because in a world where increasingly there is conflict between humans and non-humans, we need to consider our ethical steps when we deal with non-humans. Right. Now, primate social relationships, because that's what I want to talk to you about today, is rather complex because, and this again, as I said, can work for us as well, the complexity of primate social relationships comes from two levels. One is the level of the individual, because each individual has a very rich repertoire of communicative behaviors, which would facilitate expression and the ability to interact with one another and develop social relationships. But the second level of complexity comes from the society. I'm sure each of you are very, very different individual personalities, 
you have different temperaments. And when you live in a society where you interact with you, you realize that there are complex groups of individuals of different ages, sexes, dominance ranks, skinship, exactly as it is in humans, so it is in the macaques. And within these complex groups, you have subgroups, temporary alliances, and different kinds of uh, relationships that develop leading to bonds, right? These are long-term relationships that cut across these categories. This therefore results in a complex network of associations and interactions where there are many alternative strategies for survival, right? We know this even in our lives. Uh, when you interact with your family and you interact with your friends, you interact with your perhaps other unknown people with whom you are together, you have various different ways of interacting, right? You have different ways of bonding with these individuals. And the other is over time, because we are all long lived individuals, just as the bonnet macaque is, individuals can pursue a different number of strategies during their lifetimes, right? So you have had a very different relationship with your parents, and then with your friends, and then with your colleagues, in the meantime, with your spouses, with your children, and all of this varies with time as you age, and the nature of the relationship itself varies. So as you can imagine, dealing with complex, dealing with social relationships is a very complex task. And in fact, I would argue that much of our cognition, and when you say, and when I say our cognition, I mean humans, much of our cognitive time is spent in maintaining in building, in sometimes breaking down these complex relationships. So when you understand the non-human primate mind and you want to look at its evolution, you can ask a question, has social complexity evolved along the primate lines? Has social complexity selected for a greater level of intelligence? Can some of these intelligent abilities or what is called what I've called here the cognitive attributes, can they be defined functionally in non verbalizing primates and this is an important point. Why do I say non verbalizing primates because they cannot speak to us clearly much of what we know of each other and how our brain is working how our minds are working gets known to each other because of our conversations. Right now, we, when we cannot speak to the animal, how will we understand its its mind fully? That's an important question. We therefore have to be define it in terms of their behavior. Right. Sometimes, if I don't talk to, uh, let's say, my spouse for a certain period of time, she might say, "What's wrong? Why are you not speaking? How did she know that there was something in my mind?" So part of it could be behavior reading. I talk a lot. Today, I'm not talking. Part of it could be that she has read my body language. She sees the way I'm sitting. She sees my facial expressions and she knows perhaps I'm sad or I'm angry, let us say. So she reads my emotions through my body language. She reads it through my behavior, even though we are not speaking to each other. So how do we learn about higher levels of intelligence from their behavior? And very important in a philosophical question at this point is, are primates capable of reasoning, reasoning and abstractions in the absence of language? Uh, I'm not going to get into this debate. How important is language in organizing our thoughts, in making our thoughts capable of certain kinds of processes? This is a very important question. Uh, and has raised it has raised a lot of debate. And then, of course, that holy grail, are primates perceptually or reflectively conscious? But I will come to this at the end of my talk. Now, there are certain fundamental principles on the basis of which we do our studies when we want to study the non-human primate mind, right? And the first of this is called the theory of behavior, uh, theory of mind, I'm sorry. Now, as I said, many primates know and predict each other's behavior. I just talked about how my wife reads sometimes my mind by looking at my body language or my gestures, even though we are not speaking. So she, we clearly know each other's behaviors. I'm sure many of you who may have pet dogs or cats recognize that the dog or the cat is able to read your behavior. And so when you walk towards the biscuit tin, the tail wags, or you walk towards the main door, 
uh, he or she knows that you're taking him or her for a walk. You may not have spoken to them as well, right? But the important question that I have asked in my work is are they as knowledgeable about each other's beliefs, emotions, or intentions, right? So do I, does one monkey know that the other monkey is sad or it is upset? These are the important questions. And therefore, this led to this question of a theory of mind. In other words, if I'm able to attribute a belief or a knowledge or an emotion to you, then I have a theory that you have a mind. And this is called the theory of mind. And this therefore allows us to recognize specific mental states in yourself and in others, right? Now, what is a mental state? Whenever you have a thought, a desire, a memory, an emotion, an intention, you have a mental state. And the important question is, do you recognize this mental state? And do you recognize this mental state in others? And if you're able to do either of these, you have a theory of mind. And here, let's say, I've given a cartoon which shows you how reading behavior and reading mind works. If you look at the panel on the left, uh, this gentleman tells this young boy, always help the friend, never help the thief. And so the thief is coming. What will you do? He asks. And there is a little box in between them. And the boy says, I will lock the box. And the friend is coming. What will you do in the last panel? He says, I will leave the box open, right? So, so your behavior is different when you read the behavior of another individual. In this case, the uh, thief or the friend. If you go, and this is called sabotage because it follows a behavioral reading of each other. If you go to the right cartoons, it's called deception. So here when the man says, always help the friend, never help the thief, and then says, the thief is coming, what will you say? The thief comes and asks, is the box open? And the boy says, no, the box is locked. And then when the friend comes, what will you say? You say the box is open. So please note that in this case, there has been no action. You have not locked the box or opened the box. You've just left the box, but you have created an impression in the mind of the thief, which is different from the impression that you've created in the mind of the friend. And all of this you've done by changing the mental state of the thief and the friend. You know that the box is open, but you have convinced the thief that the box is locked just by saying it, and therefore by changing the state of knowledge or the state of belief of the enemy or the thief in this case, right? Therefore, this tells you that, and just to summarize that, it basically tells you that when we read each other, and this typically happens in a complex social relationship, you can read in some cases the behavior. And let me assure you that humans much of the time are reading each other's behaviors. And I include body language or different kinds of actions uh, when I talk of um, uh, uh, reading behavior. And on the other hand, at certain points, you're reading the mind. Right. So uh, you can just say, oh, uh, my mother is really upset today. I better move away. Right. This you can read either when your mother has just scolded, let's say, your sibling and you realize that she is there's a possibility she might scold you. So you move away. That is reading behavior. If, however, you tell yourself you've not seen that your mother has scolded anyone, but you know from her frown you've read her body language, you immediately know the frowning can't hurt you, but you do know that the frowning represents a mental state where in which she might scold you. And so you decide to move away. So that is basically the point I want to make and I'll return to this soon. Now, we have been studying cognitive mechanisms which has been underlying complex social behavior in macaques for a long period of time. And just to give you an idea, we now know of social knowledge what do monkeys know about each other's properties? They know about each other's dominance ranks, their social relationships. And this led, leads us to believe that there's a certain conception of the self that each of these monkeys have. Second, we've looked at attribution. I will come to that in a minute, an intentional deception where monkeys are able to cheat each other. 
We have looked at referential gestures where they use gestures to indicate a part of their body or a certain uh, desire that they may have. And this manifests also into communication, which is multimodal. In fact, I don't have time to talk about it today, but recently in the Bandipur National Park, we have discovered a new form of gesture, a new form of a call, which the macaques have developed only to communicate with humans. They don't use it for each other. They use it only to in, uh, communicate with people who are carrying food because they want that food, right? Uh, we have also looked at the tool manufacture, which is a form of mechanical intelligence. Uh, and we have tried to understand whether they have insights into how to use tools. And finally, we've looked at the flexibility in their social behavior, the way they learn from each other and how they've been able to set up cultural traditions, right? But in today's talk, of course, I will just focus very briefly on tactical deception uh, as an example of how our studies on the primate mind uh, can be carried out, right? And what are, how do we go about doing it? Now, the bonnet monkey, as you know, uh, you're all familiar with, uh, but I just wanted to just point out some features about their lives, which will tell you how complex they are. They typically live in multi-female groups, uh, which are also often multi-male. So there are a number of males and number of females living together. And the troop size can vary hugely. <clears throat> the females are what are called philopatric. And I'm sorry to use this jargon, but what it essentially means is that females live all their lives in the group in which they are born. And once they reach sexual maturity, they set up strong linear dominance hierarchies, which means that if A as a female is dominant to B, female and B is dominant to C, then A will also be dominant to C. So they have a very organized dominance hierarchy, a separate one for the males and a separate one for the females. The males, interestingly, usually emigrate when they reach sexual maturity, which means they leave the troop in which they were born and they move to other troops. But this movement may or may not happen. We've had cases where individuals have lived all their lives in their natal troops. In some cases, they have kept moving all their lives. In some cases, they moved only once and never again. Sometimes they move singly, sometimes they move in groups, and sometimes they form such strong bonds that they keep moving from group to group together, right? Males, as opposed to the females, set up very unstable dominance hierarchies, usually through a variety of strategies, which could be aggression, it could be coalitions, and there is very strong, as I said, social bonding between the males, which parallels that of females. And this is unusual. Not many species show this kind of affiliative interactions between males. The bonnet macaque is unusual in that respect. The society is promiscuous. There are periodic consortships, ample mating opportunities, a mutual tolerance for each other amongst the males, and very, very subtle female mate choice. Females choose which kind of males to mate with. This therefore tells you, and what it will tell you are two things. One, they have very complex social decision-making processes because at every stage of their life, they are taking decisions, where to stay, what to eat, who to befriend, who to mate with, who to move with permanently, who to move with sometimes. And as you can see, these complex decisions make their lives rather unpredictable. And if you look at this list that I have put in, I have said usually, generally, uh, common but not invariable, permanent or transient, unstable, unusually, what does it typically, right? What does this mean? It means that there is no species typical rule. There is no way you can predict a bonnet macaque's lives simply because each is very, very different from another. And in fact, in our Bandipur project, where we've been studying this species in the Bandipur National Park and Mudumalai uh, Wildlife Sanctuary for about 20 years now, we have actually identified more than 2,000 individuals by face. And let me assure you, each of them is a unique individual. Right. And here on the right, you will see five pictures of five males from our Bandipur population. 
And just as they differ in their hairstyle, they also differ in their behavior. They also differ in their life history strategies. They also differ in their social decisions. And uh, in fact, what you will also realize is that not only morphologically, because they have such different hairstyles, by the way, the bonnet is a French word for the cap. So the cap of hair on their heads is very distinctive and it allows us to identify individuals very easily. So when we studied these 2000 individuals in Bandipur, we have not radio collared them, we have not tagged them. These are entirely non-invasive studies. We just know them by face and we know them by behavior, right? So moving on, I want to just discuss another framework which is important for us to understand deception, which is called intentionality. And Daniel Dennett is a philosopher who pointed out and who, who actually constructed a theoretical framework to understand mental states and our understanding of mental states, which I talked about earlier. Now, what Dennett suggests is that when any individual has a specific mental state, which is a belief or a desire or an emotion or a memory or whatever, it becomes an intentional being. And when you have an intentional being, you can actually distinguish different levels of intentionality in these beings, right? Now, the first order is what is called a zero order intentional being, where there is absolutely no mental states at all. There is no belief, there is no desire, there is only instinct. So let me give you an example. When my bonnet macaques in Bandipur see a leopard, they immediately give an alarm call. And as soon as they give an alarm call, all the other macaques who can hear this call runs up the trees, right? Now, the question is, did the macaque want to give the call? Does the macaque believe there is a leopard? Does the macaque want others to believe that there's a leopard? You can ask these questions in this framework. And I will argue, and as Dennett did, that if the macaque is a zero order being, intentional being, it has no belief system. You see the um, leopard, you give a call. You hear a call, you run up the trees. I tap your knee, you have a knee jerk response. I put my finger towards your eyes, you blink. Did you think about blinking? Did you think of the knee jerk response? Of course you didn't. It's an instinct. So your knee jerk response and your blinking of your eye makes you a zero order being, at least as far as that behavior goes. Of course, you're capable of far greater orders of intentionality, which I will point out. And the important question is, are the bonnet macaques also capable of that? So if you are a first order being, and if my bonnet macaque is a first order being, then she gives an alarm call because she believes there's a leopard there, but she has no clue, no idea about the beliefs of the other individuals. You can also be a higher order being. And thus, I will just discuss two higher orders. The second order, if you're a second order being, there is some conception of your own and that of others' mental states. And if the bonnet macaque is a second order being, then she gives an alarm call because she believes there's a leopard and she wants others to believe there's a leopard. That's it. If, however, she's a third order intentional being, she gives an alarm call because she believes that there's a leopard and she wants others to believe that she believes there's a leopard, right? So if you're a third order intentional being, you're able to not only uh, uh, visualize your own mental states, those of the others, but you're able to convince others about your own mental state. That makes it third order. And as you realize, I'm able to give this talk to you because I have third order intentionality. I believe I know what is in the next slide. I know that you don't know what is in the next slide, but I want you to believe that I know what is in the next slide. That makes for third order intentionality. And the interesting bit here is that for us to have a conversation, we need third order intentionality. For an individual to teach others, third order intentionality is necessary. 
And interestingly, an anagram from teaching, you need third order intentionality to cheat others, right? So therefore, a higher order intentionality, as I'm sure you now realize, represents the ability to simultaneously have two different states of the mind within your mind, that of the actor, that of the audience. I know what I'm thinking, I'm trying, I know what you're thinking, right? Or I know what I know, and I know what you don't know, right? What's coming below. So, uh, so this is higher order intentionality, and I'm able to recognize a discrepancy. <clears throat> I know what's coming in the lower part of the slide. None of you know what is coming in the lower part of the slide. So I'm recognizing a difference between our mental states. Interestingly, children learn how to attribute knowledge to others. It is not what you're born with. Initially, and I don't have time to go into this, initially, children think what they know is what everybody else knows, right? There's no difference between them. Later, you start realizing that I know certain things which others don't, and I can communicate it to them, right? So the, it develops over time. And very tragically, it doesn't develop in certain cases of autism. In autism, is, uh, autism, of course, is, and as Shibu knows far, far better than I do, uh, autism is, of course, a case, it's a, it's a very multidimensional uh, disorder. But one of the aspects of that is a failure to develop social relationships. And what we argue and has been argued in the past is that part of the reason could be that they lack third order intentionality. In other words, autistic children are not able to recognize the difference in mental state between their companions and themselves. So it's like this. If I know that my name is Anindya Sinha, and if I am not able to recognize the fact that your name, that you do not know that my name is Anindya Sinha, if I think that if I know I'm Anindya Sinha and the whole world knows I'm Anindya Sinha, what is there to talk about, right? What is there to communicate? Communication happens only when you recognize that someone else has a different mental state and extremely tragically, autistic individuals, perhaps some autistic individuals perhaps lack this capacity. They're just congenitally, they do not have it. Right, so let me quickly move to tactical deception. Uh, so as you realize human-like deception and please remember the famous story of the boy who cried wolf several times, the villagers came to his attention and then when uh, he actually had the wolves coming, nobody came anymore, right? So what does human-like deception requires? It requires an actor to create a false belief in the mind of their audience and for the actor to recognize that the audience's mental state can be changed without necessarily changing your own. The boy who cried wolf knew that there was no wolf, but made other villagers believe there was a wolf. So he made the other's mental state change by saying that there was a wolf without necessarily changing his own, right? He continued to believe that there were no wolves. Similarly, in non-human primates, what they often do is that they use an, a behavior from its normal repertoire, but in a different situation where it's likely to be misinterpreted by an audience and the actor then benefits from this use. We do know that some of these acts of tactical deception happen very commonly across individuals, but what we do not know is, is this genuinely intentional? When a macaque cheats another macaque, it is, is it actually creating a false belief in the mind of the macaque, or is it simply acting on the basis of its behavior reading? And let me just give a simple um, uh, example. There is a dominant male who's chasing a subordinate male, and suddenly the subordinate male stands up on his hind legs, looks into the distance, and gives an alarm call. As soon, and there is nothing out there. I'm following them. I know there are no wolves, there are no foxes, there are no leopards, there's no predator, no dogs in the city when we look at the macaques in the city. And yet, this act makes the dominant male who's chasing him stop and similarly look around for the predator and the subordinate male immediately runs off, right? So this is cheating. 
And the question is, is this truly intentional? That's the, that's the basic uh, pith of my work. So now what you realize is that uh, deception, there can be certain context to deception. There can also be certain behaviors that you use to deceive. And the simple question we asked was, what is the kind of variability that you have across these contexts where you cheat and the behaviors that you use to cheat, right? So that is the, those are the two parameters. And just to give you an idea, <clears throat> the, uh, the most important acts of deception are during mating, right? The most different kinds. So sexual cheating seems to be as common in macaques as perhaps they are in humans as well. And the kinds of uh, behaviors that are used or that kind of context in which they use uh, uh, their deception is to disrupt the sexual pursuit of others, to pursue their own sexual interest, when somebody is showing a sexual advance, you avoid it. And all of this can be done through deception. The second most important context is in the case of aggression. And when there is social aggression, you can avoid aggression. You can avert aggression and move it to someone else. So you deflect it or you can actually effectuate aggression. You're able to show aggression when, through cheating, which you were not able to do earlier. The third context in which they do it is to obtain food, right? Someone has food, the other doesn't have food. Can he or she gain that food by cheating the other individual? And the finally is through affiliation when there are friendships and individuals want to disrupt these friendships, they can use sometimes tactical deception to break friendships, right? So as you can see, deception is being used in a variety of social contexts much as it is in the case of humans. And you will possibly be struck by the kind of evolutionary forces that seem to have generated similar abilities amongst bonnet macaques and ourselves to follow similar kinds of behavioral strategies. And the functional or the behavioral categories that they use is called inhibition of, in it can be inhibition of interest. A male is following a female. When suddenly a dominant male appears who could attack the male for following the female, he immediately drops all interest. He just sort of starts feeding, doesn't even look at the female, but you know that he hasn't lost interest because as soon as the dominant male moves away, he resumes his following of the female. There can be threat behavior, there can be non-responsive behavior. I will give one or two examples in just a, a minute. Uh, there can be a non-contextual call, which I talked about earlier. There is no predator, and yet I give a predator alarm call simply because I can then fool uh, my aggressor. There can be neutral behavior where I pretend nothing is happening. There can be diversion of aggression. You're attacking me, but somehow I can make you attack someone else. I deflect that attention away. So that's called diversion of aggression. So these are the different behaviors that a macaque uses. And in this slide, this is one particular true B1 where we studied deception. And I just want to show you. So on, uh, on the left where you see PK, HL, GD, PI, HS, these are all males, the names of the males. And on the and down below, when you say functional categories, these are the different categories of behaviors of cheating. Now, PK, HL, GDPI were four adult males. I was studying this troop for almost eight months. There was just one act of deception by one of them. And then four subadult juvenile males came into the group. And over the next four months, look at the kind, and look at the uh, numbers of deceptive acts that I saw these young individuals perform, right? And amongst them, HS was particularly impressive. He had the largest number of deceptive acts over those four months. And what's fascinating is I have so many ones because he has shown different kinds of deceptive behaviors once each. And you will immediately realize that that makes for very smart deception. Because if you keep repeating the same kind of deception, you're caught out. So you vary it. You are infrequent. You don't show it all the time. And that HS, the fact that a young individual called HS was able to do this tells you that there may be an inherent ability where some individuals are better at cheating than are others. Familiar with us? Right. 
And here, I just wanted to give an example of the kind of flexibility that HS showed once he had become an adult in this troop. <coughs> I'm sorry. He could avoid, so the contexts are in black boxes, the red boxes show the behaviors. So when somebody tried to attack him, he could avoid that aggression by either inhibition of interest, as I gave an example, he was following a female, inhibited his interest, avoided the attack and later resumed his interest. He could show affiliative behavior, which is when an animal comes to attack him, he quickly starts allo grooming him, going through his hair, which you must have seen the macaques do a lot. He could also show non-responsive behavior. There was a case when an adult male kept uh, uh, showing aggression, but he pretended he couldn't hear it just by looking away and chewing on a blade of grass. He also used a non-contextual call. He also used a non-contextual call to disrupt the sexual pursuit of another individual and use threat behavior as well to disrupt the sexual behavior, uh, pursuit of another individual. And he used affiliative to advance his own sexual interest towards a particular female. So therefore, this tells you the kind of complexity of not only the social relationships that HS has, but also the various strategies that it has to use in different contexts thanks, it to actually show deception. And this will give you an idea of the kind of not only the complex society, the complex decision making as well that individuals have to follow and the kinds of strategies they use. So let me summarize this part of the work. Uh, so individuals who exhibited high levels of deception, exhibited great variability, deceived in many different functional categories, they did not invariably use deceptive strategies in apparently identical situations, so they were able to voluntarily control whether they would show deception or not. Some individuals changed the repertoire of deceptive behavior following changes in their social environment. Different functional categories were used, that means different behaviors were used by certain individuals to deceive in a particular context, whereas the same behavior could be used in a variety of contexts, showing how much of flexibility individuals had. The variability, the generalization, the flexibility in tactical deception shown by Bonnet Macaques, therefore indicates a very strong cognitive basis to this complex decision-making process. And we believe, therefore, that these macaques, when they cheat, are not just behavior reading. They are also mind reading. They are also recognizing and perhaps occasionally changing the mental states of others. And we believe, as I referred to earlier, that they are second order intentional beings. They possibly don't have the kind of sophisticated cheating capacities that humans have because they are not third order beings. They are not therefore able to teach others. They're not able to perhaps carry out conversations with one another because they are not third order beings. They are second order beings. So therefore, let me now move and I will just take another five minutes uh, to just wrap up my work by talking about consciousness, right? Now, consciousness is clearly extremely important to us. But what is interesting is that although consciousness string, springs from our central nervous system, from within our bodies, and I'm talking here as a scientist, not as a theologian, because clearly in theology, there are different kinds of definitions of spirituality, of consciousness, which goes beyond the body, which as a biologist, I do not recognize. And therefore, we realize that consciousness, which is our own property, is important because it gives meaning to our lives. Much of our work is unconscious, much of our thinking. I drive a car while having a conversation with a friend, I don't, I'm not even conscious of the way I'm driving the car. And yet, whenever we are conscious, it gives great meaning to our lives, right? And therefore, the reason why we need to understand whether other beings are conscious or not is because we can then locate humans in the natural world. Are we the only conscious beings? What are the limits of our knowledge about consciousness, which tells us that we may not yet know the full story? As I mentioned earlier, if we do know that bonnet macaques are conscious, what is the moral significance of the way we interact with them? If you knew they were conscious, would you relocate them from your housing complex? Or would you allow them to stay? Would you be able to create pain? Are you 
willing to create pain in them, knowing that they recognize the pain simply when you trap them to relocate them. And therefore, there are various theories of consciousness which we can then explore in these. And the important question is, are primates conscious? Is the bonnet macaque conscious? And here, unfortunately, it really depends on the way we define consciousness. And I don't have time to go into it, but there are multiple definitions of consciousness that scientists, that philosophers provide. And depending on how you define consciousness, you may be able to decide whether the bonnet macaque is conscious or not. There is, however, a need perhaps for an unambiguous functional definition. Maybe, maybe we need to have a definition, but I really despair because everybody defines consciousness in different ways. And I wanted to also raise the point of qualia. When you look at the blue sky and you feel happiness, do you know whether others exactly experience their vision of the blue sky in the same way? Perhaps not. Maybe after a certain incident has happened in your life, you look at the blue sky very differently. Maybe before it created a sense of happiness, today it may create a sense of sadness. So even within ourselves, there are changes that come up in our qualia in the way we respond very consciously, but sometimes almost unknowingly to different response, to different stimuli. And the question then is, can qualia ever be scientifically explored because it's unfathomable almost, even in science, right? And here I have a small definition that I provide here. Perceptual consciousness is the ability <clears throat> to have certain mental states, including emotions, thoughts, beliefs, desires, memories. All of us are perceptually conscious. There's no doubt about it. The question is, can you also reflect on your own perceptions and mental states? Some of you may have already got bored by my talk and you know that you're bored and you really want an India to stop. So you are able to read your own mental state. So you're reflectively conscious as well, right? And how do I know that you are reflectively conscious? Because now you, one of you will pipe up and tell me, Anindya, please stop. I'm bored of your talk. You have been able to communicate to me the fact that you're reflectively conscious. Let me tell you that if I spent a whole day without you and we don't speak to each other, I would not know whether you are reflectively conscious or not. You will drink water. You will eat some food. You are perceptually conscious. I know that but I will never know whether you can think about your mental states. That only we get to know because we are able to talk to each other. So people can tell us about their conscious thoughts, but bonnet macaques cannot. And that is the fundamental problem in understanding whether other beings are truly conscious or not. If you have a relative or a friend who is deaf and mute, who is able not to communicate with you, you will never perhaps know his or her thoughts. That's the point I want to make. So this is my last slide. I want to summarize by saying that bonnet macaques are inherently capable of solving complex social problems, for example, through tactical deception. The species may also be inherently capable of making very complex social decisions on the basis of their experiential knowledge. I've not had time to look at it, but through experience, they learn about each other and they're able to take complex decisions on that basis. Individual macaques, in fact, seem to know very comprehensively the positions of other individuals in the dominance hierarchy. They understand the social relationships of other individuals even if they have not directly interacted with two individuals, just by observing two other individuals, they know who's dominant and who's subordinate. Therefore, individual macaques seem to be able to form rudimentary mental representations of themselves, of others, generated by direct personal experience. And such individuals may also have a limited capacity to recognize their own mental states and those of their adversaries and act upon the available differences in their knowledge states. And finally, are bonnet macaques truly conscious? This depends on the way we define consciousness. Their inner thoughts and emotions are thus, I suggest, likely to remain unknown to us forever. Thank you. Wow, that's great, Anindya. Very nice. Very interesting thoughts about something most of us haven't really reflected on, I guess. Uh, shall I stop my slides before the discussion? Is it okay? 
yeah uh, yeah okay like yeah you, you can do, can you do can you do one thing can you play that video once more the first video so that now that we've heard all this we can look at it with sure, new sure, lights absolutely let me just do that <clears throat> so this is where it's washing the mango and here it will with its left hand it will remove after this it will remove a speck of dirt or whatever and wash his hand so here he has removed he will now do that and he uses water as a tool because he's washing his hands and now he will keep the mango under his foot and he forgets where he has kept it so now clearly he's searching for the mango and uh, he's not only looking but he's also feeling so he's <laughs> using different sense organs to actually find the mango so he has a very good template of what he's looking for he's not picking up a stone he's picking up only the mango and then he finds the mango and he washes it again and this interestingly is a cultural tradition uh, because only five males five brothers who came down to the river learned how to wash mangoes they learned by watching each other and once they moved away from the river they stopped washing mangoes and that culture was lost forever so just like in humans you have behavioral or cultural traditions that are set up even amongst non humans but they sometimes can be lost when they don't have the opportunity to use it anymore yeah that's that's then nice. that is good so let, can you stop, can you stop yeah. sharing the slide then we can all look at uh, it on india can i go first oh sure <laughs> yeah. wonderful we have so far seen these creatures as fearful intrusions into our lives and i've been wondering how to capture them i think uh, the good insight almost like a living human being we understood a few things i have one question which is why you rated them below humans in uh, intentionality right they don't have the third degree intentionality and also on consciousness right but would you believe amongst all animals would you be ticking them off as top box number 1 it's difficult to say uh, uh, shibu because uh, and the reason why i'm saying it's difficult to say that is because uh, as you're i'm sure you're aware if you really want to look at cognitive capacities or cognitive abilities there are different domains right so for example my wife can actually repair every electronic device that's possible but i'm hopeless at it but if there's a stranger who comes to the door she is hopeless at it i will be able to deal with him or her so easily so i think just as even within humans and howard gardner talks of these his theory of multiple intelligences we specialize in different <laughs> capacities all cognitive i think different species may have also evolved differently so i'll just give you an example chimpanzees are great social they are they have great social intelligence they're extremely complex socially and yet they have very simple foraging techniques but look at the gorilla the gorilla has a very simple society the kind of social relationships that gorillas have is absolutely perfunctory but it has now been documented that they have 120 ways of processing food so their entire the evolution of their cognitive capacities has been in their ability to process different kinds of food because they are eff effectively they are vegetarians or uh, and so therefore they process a whole range of plant food so therefore would you call a chimpanzee more intelligent than the gorilla it would depend on what is the domain of activity or behavior that we are looking at so that would be my answer so therefore i think we are living in a network of cognitive capacities it's very difficult to place one above the other just as it is within human society who do you think is the smartest it depends on what kind of activity you are looking for great yeah shibu go ahead go ahead, ahead. ahead madhu sir no no i i just want to make a comment mr sena it was absolutely outstanding till now <laughs> till now we have been uh, sort of trying to get rid of the monkeys that come to our complex so, no no i don't know but shibu what i want to i'll tell you i want to make a comment on neas which <coughs> many of us in the group may not know the national institute of advanced studies 
was founded in 1988 and it was the brainchild of mr jari tata mm. mr jari tata felt that the that india is producing uni uni unidimensional managers and unidimensional leaders and he wanted managers and leaders to develop as to a wholesome human beings that is how this institute was started with uh, leadership development as the main program of the institute but over the last uh, 30 years 30 33 years it has developed into something quite remarkable and many of us ought to know what it does it does it, be, it has become a think tank it has become a research institute it does it does research on a wide variety of subjects ranging from security studies of india our relationship with pakistan our relationship with china uh, what are the strategies should be behind it uh, you know studies on consciousness studies on animal behavior that uh, mr sena is doing and uh, uh, archaeometallurgy heritage of india temple architecture any number of subjects of national importance and historical importance or studied in the national institute of advanced sciences it started in pune in 1988 just now it is in bangalore in the campus of the institute of science and it's a wonderful campus and in fact uh, one day if many if some of us uh, have time we should spend a couple of hours uh, listening to the director over there shailesh naik as to what does that institute does it has got tremendously diverse programs and very interesting programs of uh, varied nature so that's an introduction to nias but anandya lala you anandya sena you have already introduced but mr sena it is a wonderful wonderful talk thank you very much yeah ema uh, so uh, this thing about monkeys being conscious uh, i don't think it has come as a shell shock to any of us we were uh, i think this was a chapter in uh, one of our school textbooks called mere monkeys long time ago in our childhood yeah. about how this mother took revenge on this villainous monkey for having uh, killed her baby so that is something we are all i think uh, this is like i know everybody is throwing the line and saying oh we you know monkeys are conscious we are not going to hurt them not true <laughs> the, what i'm saying is what would you uh, what's your uh, uh, thoughts about the uh, idea that uh, uh, these monkeys or obviously your monkeys in bandipur are free and unfettered and eating berries and fruits no, but they're... once they become urbanized uh-huh. uh, what what do you think is uh, uh, going to happen to them if they start eating burger patties and lace chips and is okay. that good for them yeah. and when they come into our homes and flick a sausage and eat it that's not good for them so in if you if you start looking at it like that uh, maybe we have to say tranquilize them or sedate them and relocate them back to their forest in the short term we know that it is painful and maybe you know then that's not going to be nice for them they're not going to like it but then we don't like vaccinations either you know we don't like iv antibiotics when we are sick but we do all that to get better uh, that's my uh, take on it what do you think about what's your uh... so you know uh, whatever you've asked me can make a stuff for at least three other lectures of our on our work mm-hmm. but let me just very briefly yeah. summarize uh, very pointedly tell you yeah, time, time to give you evidence right now first do do packet hai na do packet usko so uh, firstly usko the bakaks of bangalore their lives are changing forever thanks to humans right the tourists and if you've been there you'll see that the tourists to uti continuously throw food to the monkeys and i can give another talk maybe another day uh, here where because we've been studying that for 20 years that has led to a complete disruption of their sociality it has led to completely different new behavioral profiles that have developed and overall it has been detrimental so this isn't is it a, better that they are relocated away from our no, no, no 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 let me come to that they even within the forests they are becoming urbanized and we are to blame right yeah. so we are changing their lives forever that's point 1 point 2 they are remarkably adaptable and i can tell you that even if they eat burger patties they will survive in fact in delhi 
in the because we have a study on the urban macaques of Delhi, we know that there is diabetes, there is obesity, there are a whole range of very, very human like physiological changes in many of them. But the populations do wonderfully well. I think that's the evolutionary success story of these macaques. They are far more adaptable to a variety of situations, ecological, social, than we are. And so there is no fear. All the macaques will do very well. And I so that's the other point. When they do so very well and they breed so much, Correct. and when their numbers increase and when they get aggressive, yeah. then what are we to do? Because yeah. they are harbingers of uh, diseases and you know, they could yeah. hurt us. Well, they're harbingers of disease as much as other humans are. So I don't think they give you especially more diseases I than... I mean, rabies, for instance. No, well, yes, but very rare. Very rare. I think I'm more likely uh, to get infected by other humans than uh, I would get rabies. I've studied, for, I've studied them for 20 years, actually for almost 25, 26 years now. And I've worked with so many individuals. I've been bitten only once, only once. And that's because it was trying to get into the car to take away uh, whatever I had in the car. And I tried to you know, resist that and I got bitten. So it's actually in a human interaction uh, where he has learned how to come in and take food from the car simply because humans like us, like me, started feeding them. So that's it. So to come back to what you were saying, I think we should acknowledge the fact that we are moving them out only because we don't want them here. It's not for their good. They will not do better oh, yeah. to move them out. Yeah, so th that's fine. And I think it's an important philosophical point. And I often bring this up because I think it helps us to gain perspective of the situation. I'll tell you another uh, a point I want to make here is that why translocation is bad for them. One is of course, the trauma of being translocated, which let's say we can ignore. Because as, as you said, that we also go through these kind of traumas for our own good, except that this trauma is not for their own good. Partly, number one, their societies get broken up. Mothers get separated from their infants. It's often extremely difficult to trap every single individual and move them. That's point number one. Point number two, believe me, like stray dogs, if you move away a group of macaques, others will come and take their place. There is no way you will be free of macaques. Yes, the probability will come down because over time they are uh, declining in numbers. And so maybe 20 years later, you will not have macaques coming in, even if you trap the last troop. That's the uh, point number two. Point number three, there are sterilization programs that are being- Yeah, contacted. that would be nice. Yes. So we're just like stray dogs, we sterilize them. But of course, you must realize that, and, and I talked about their social system, you have to sterilize every female. Because even if you sterilize 99% of the males, the 1% of the males that are not sterilized can potentially fertilize all the females in the population. So that's a much tougher task, right? As, um, you, know, as you know, that sterilization of females is, requires a much more complex surgical procedures than that of the males, that's one. And the last point I want to make about relocation, and this is interesting, there are two aspects to it. One, where will you move them out? So you pointed out that we can move them into the forests. That itself is problematic, not only because number one, they, it'll be a completely new environment for them. We don't always expect them to adjust wonderfully because of their history of developing in this particular area, taking them to the forest may not necessarily work for them. Number two, they may actually carry back pneumonia. They may carry back tuberculosis many of which they may have got even from humans in close contact, and they can bring in these zoonotics into the wild populations when you move them there. The third point is that they will not stay within the forest because they are so used to this kind of food, they will soon make a beeline for the nearest hamlet or the village or the town that is there, so they will come back. And the final point is that when you translocate them, actually, you are transferring the problem to someone else. And typically, and we have written about this, it's a reflection of human politics, human sociology, that you translocate individuals, macaques, to communities who are below you in the hierarchy, in the dominance hierarchy. So city centers will move them to the city periphery, city peripheries will move them to towns, towns will move them to villages, villages will move them to other hamlets. Wherever people don't have a voice, 
they will end up with a group of macaques because those who have a voice has managed to translocate them. This is something that we have observed over time. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just trying to point out that these are the dimensions that we need to think about when we bring about translocation. So personally, if you ask me, all I can suggest to you is put up wire mesh in your windows, keep your doors closed when you're leaving the town, uh, when, you're, uh, 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 when you're not in the house or when you're not in the room. I do know that all your plants, some of your plants may go, but then we get bitten by mosquitoes as well. And we have cockroaches sometimes in our kitchens as well. And we do have COVID-19, which is coming to us from our friends as well. So we deal with these hazards. And I would therefore suggest that we, we try to think of coexistence in whichever way possible, because relocation really doesn't work well for the macaques as well, as well as where you relocate them. Different kinds of problems are generated there. What are the lifespans? Yeah. Lifespan, how much is it? Uh, so typically they live for about 18 to 20 years, but oh I have seen individuals who live for 20, but they're, they're young. So one possibility is for them to be sterilized and brought back, etc. But again, philosophical point, please do remember that, you know, they were here before us. We were, we are taking away no, this. No, we were here before them. This no, is a very few. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are seeing the macaques after you move there. Yeah. But where, where were, what was the land use like before the complex? It was a paddy field. There were no macaques. Yeah. Oh, there would have been macaques in the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. We would they, like Mr. to. Mr. Sinha. Mr. Sinha. Yes. This is Mutravan here. Yes. You know, we, we are having a real practical problem in our complex. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I can and imagine. we have visitors, uh, you know, these monkeys come about 25 to 30 in number. Some of us are terrified by the sight of that and they come and bash up our garden and uh, spoil our trees. Now, while you can be human and considerate to all other uh, living beings, how can you put up with an aggressor? How do you tackle an aggressor? I think he will explain that. Uh, Mr. No, no, no. I, oh. I understand what he's saying. So, for example, the University of Agricultural Sciences campus, right? That's where I began to study the macaques. At one point, they really cracked down on the macaques, translocated them all. Others came and took their place. And today, they continue to live with them, but they have uh, netting. And as I said, they have these different practices. I can tell you one thing. If you don't interact with them, yeah. they will not attack you. See, they learn who, which individual is afraid of them because you challenge them, right? So there are certain very basic rules. Uh, don't look at them in the eye, for example. Avoid interacting with them. <laughs> Unless they are able to come in and they take your food, which of course can happen on occasions, never feed them. Keep your garbage uh, sort of uh, boxes or garbage bins completely sealed shut so that they don't have. The only way they will go away is when they realize that they don't have food here. Because the, the, the primary driver for them coming in is food. Now, I know that it may not be possible for you to protect all uh, from them in this way, but even if you're able to cut down 90% of their access to food over time, I suspect they will move away, their growth rates will come down. That might actually happen. So uh, in some sense, therefore, I really don't have a solution. A lot of people ask me, and farmers, for example, who are losing so much more, they lose their livelihoods, uh, not only to macaques, they're losing to elephants. And that's another story. Uh, we've been also working on elephants and they're coming into crop fields. The forests have been cut down. The elephants have nowhere to go. So then should we be like Singapore? Kill off all non-humans that we don't like? Or do we live with them? But there is really no practical way you can keep them out. It just doesn't work. So that's what my practical learnings uh, have been. And that's all I can advise you. And, and other than that, there's really nothing I can say. Very you you, men uh, you mentioned that the macaques, when they deal with humans, yeah. their interaction uh, is in a slightly different way compared to when they interact with other monkeys. Yeah. So is, is there some way we can uh, improve our interaction with them or uh, their interaction with us? I mean, is there a way of communicating? Just things? as I said, that over 25 years, I've only been attacked once, which means that I'm doing something right, as if you're looking at aggression, right? So I'll tell you what are the rules I follow. Typically, and this, of course, I'm not asking you to do, 
I sit down when I'm with them because you know when I'm towering above them, it's like dogs. When I'm towering above them, they consider me a greater threat than when I'm slightly shorter. They tend to attack shorter people much more. Even in you know in temples or in tourist places, they tend to attack females much more human females than they attack human males. And that's partly because females may be shorter, they may be more diminutive in their stature. Females may also show signs of more nervousness. I don't know, but the macaques is clearly using that, right? I don't look at them in the eye. One of the surest way to avoid being attacked by a monkey, as it is with a dog as well, is to look away. When a monkey looks at you and you look away, it indicates to it that you're not interested in it. And when you're not interested in it, it will not attack you. In fact, I've been chased by other species of macaques and I just stop short and I just look away because if you run, they will definitely follow you. It's true for elephants as well. But if you look away, I'm not saying this about elephants, I'm saying this about macaques. If you look away, it's a clear indication to them that you're not interested in them. Avoid carrying food when they are around. If you carry packets, they invariably get interested. So maybe you can postpone your going out by 10, 15 minutes. Once the macaques have moved away, then you go out. Because the moment they see packets, they tend to attack because they've learned the association of that. Right? So as I said, keep doors shut, keep windows shut when they're around. Open it after they have gone because they'll never be there all day. They will come and they will go away. Right? And uh, so some of these basic rules, and I've spoken to other apartment uh, resident associations about this as well and with very limited suggestions very limited knowledge yeah mr sinha we will take some notes from you and circulate to all I, will, I think i may have a document which i can perhaps email to you yeah yeah seriously i, I think we will take that from you sure <laughs> it will solve all of our problems <laughs> yeah so basically what i'm saying is become uh, become primatologists watch them uh, and try and prevent interactions with them. But I think, uh, um, as I think Mr. Suresh Narayanan will vouch for, they are fascinating animals. And I think, uh, you know, you learn so much by watching them. You know, our roots of our behavior are in them. And, uh, and, and finally, when you look at them and see all that they're doing to you and to your houses, it's no different from what we do in our daily lives, either across areas within a city, when we, when we ask for slums to be removed, or as nations, when we go to war with each other, we kill civilians. And remember that they do not systematically practice that at all. All they're asking for is food. And we don't want that to happen. So we cut down food for them. We don't give them food. That's fine. That's absolutely acceptable. If you don't let them have food, they will go away. They will go away. But physically removing them, uh, doesn't really work, at least in my experience. Suresh, any comments? Uh, fascinating, uh, Anindya. Really, uh, really, I was riveted to every slide of yours. You know, I was reading an, an article that uh, there is a, a colony of macaques in Java. And uh, apparently these, uh, these macaques, uh, they literally blackmail uh, people coming with, with food. And they have developed an order of what is precious to the human being. That's right. So That's if it is like uh, spectacles and glasses and stuff like that, they throw it away. But apparently they get hold of a credit card yeah. and they threaten to bite it. Yeah. And immediately they find that the person is throwing more food at them. Right. Have you noticed such behavior? It, it looks pretty intelligent. Huh? I mean, it's not a... Well, it's, it's intelligent in some sense. It's not intelligence because it's learned. Okay. You learn the association. It's like crossing the road. You cross the road. If you don't look left and right, you get hit by a car. You learn that. It doesn't require much intelligence to learn that. It does require a certain form of intelligence, but not, as I was talking about, rationalization. Uh, however, when you cross the road on a Sunday and you decide not to look left and right, that is intelligent. That is rationalization. So this work that you're talking about, this is an Uluwatu temple. It's a temple in Java. Uh, the work is by a very close friend and collaborator of mine. We work together, actually. Uh, this is a bartering system. So what Suresh is referring to is where monkeys take away uh, valuables, and they will only throw it back if you give them food. And, and what um, uh, J.B. Lika, the main author, shows is that the more precious the item is that they take away, the more food they require before they return it. 
So they've learned in some sense the value of what they take, and this is simply learned. Now, coming back to your question, Suresh, we've seen this behavior in Shimla, and I have a video of this actually, uh, where Makak will actually take away and give back only when you give it food. It's known from Haridwar, it's known from Banaras, it's known from a large number of uh, areas. That species is called a long-tailed macaque. We now know it from rhesus macaques. So other species have developed it. We have not formally studied it the way uh, J.B. Leka has studied it in Uluwatu in Indonesia. Uh, we haven't studied it, but I think different macaques have learned this ability to transact with humans. Mm. And, uh, you're right. I mean, there is a certain amount of intelligence that allows it to do it, mm, but uh, they are uh, they're extremely good at it. And yeah. and the la and uh, maybe but, another but, talk. And and on communication, I was telling you about the communication. They have learned that they can, they should communicate only with those carrying food. We've done experiments, and the same individual doesn't carry food. The macaque will not communicate with it. So it has a very directed goal of getting the food, and it communicates in very unusual ways. Most people that we've interviewed say is so cute that they're willing to give food. So the use of the call or the use of the gesture that the macaque uh, is bringing in also is shaped by the human response. So they are watching us as well. So they make good primatologists as well, is what I'm saying. Thank so, you. I mean, and in the, the problem here in our place is, I don't think people are feeding the macaques. Right. Uh, the plenty of- there are plenty of banana trees, right, papaya right. trees, fig trees <laughs> for them to feast on. Absolutely, so. absolutely. No, it's a it's a very difficult situation, sir. I really don't know what the solution is. Uh, all I'm saying is that, uh, yeah, there's a certain uh, uh, a loss that we share when we have them around, and uh, I don't know how to prevent it because. I don't. Uh, I don't think anybody has found the perfect solution to removing, to removing this problem. No, at least we will do some do's and don'ts. Yeah, sure. I'll, I, at least in personal interactions, so yeah. that you don't get attacked. Yeah, that which I, I which I'll take it. Which I'll take it from you. Sure, I will email it to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Anindya. That was a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you for that talk. Thank you. We really you. enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. And Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Excellent. No, thank you very much for inviting me. It's quite an honor, actually. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to interacting with you again. And please do take uh, Mr. Muthuraman's suggestion seriously and do come and visit Nias when you have the time. I think it'll be wonderful. Oh, great. We'll, we'll be there. And <laughs> you may want us to leave before. <laughs> we, will, we will tolerate you just as we tolerate you. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again.